I have to tell you, when I come to an institution such as this with the kind of history that this institution has, and particularly uh, on a day such as this when we are, as you know, commemorating the, uh, the 200th anniversary of the birth of Martin Delaney, I begin to think about the historicity of both the space right, and the historical place uh, where we find ourselves. It's very hard not to. You know, I came in and I was looking at the stained glass and I went back in the back and I saw some of the older pictures of this building going back generations and I realized that on the one hand, if you looked around in the background of this church, um, you didn't see a lot of the buildings obviously that you see now. So in many regards, this community has changed, has grown up around this building. That is the historicity of the community. Things change. And yet, uh, there is so much about this space that hasn't changed as you look around, from the actual physical structure to the stonework, all of it, to so much of the glass, uh, you begin to realize that in spite of the change, there's also an awful lot of continuity. And when we think about this issue that Martin Delaney was thinking about 200 years ago, all the way until the time of his death, we have to remember that the same is true with our history as a country as is true with this building and this structure as a church, that even though there's an awful lot uh, that has changed in that 200 years, let's say, uh, since he was born, uh, there is also an awful lot that has remained frighteningly the same. And so the very same issues that Martin Delaney addressed and spoke to, uh, we must speak to today, even though we are being told that that conversation isn't really as necessary as it once was. Was. We're being told that this conversation about race and racism and our concern about these issues is passe, that it is something we should leave in the historical dustbin of our past because it isn't relevant to us any longer. But I think if we look around and if we engage with our current political, social reality, honestly, we have to recognize that one of the things that is most certainly not changed in that 200 years is the centrality of race, and more to the point, the centrality of racism and institutional white supremacy, though we don't usually call it that, because we have a penchant for using very dishonest language in our culture rather than telling the truth. But if we're being honest, we have to see that the centrality of that thing is as true today uh, as it was 200 years ago, however much more subtle it may seem to some. I would suggest, in fact, that it is very difficult, if not impossible, for any of us to understand contemporary politics in this country without understanding the role of race and racism in shaping those politics. Because no matter what the issue that we are addressing as a country, no matter what the issue that our politicians may be speaking about in a given day, whether it's education, whether it's health care reform, whether it's job creation, taxes, crime, immigration, even war. If you look beneath the surface of almost all of those conversations, not almost all of them, all of them, what you will find too often is that what we're really talking about, even if we're not being honest enough to admit it, is in fact the issue of race, and more specifically, the way in which we look at some within our human society and our national society as the dreaded other. Now, we know we've done this with war historically. I mean, if you look at the history of this country's involvement with military aggression and imperialism and war, we know that we have always tended to racialize our adversaries, the other. We have otherized them. We did so with indigenous peoples, most certainly we did so with those in Mexico when we launched a war of aggression against that sovereign nation so as to make Texas safe for slavery. They were a racialized, a minoritized group seen as inferior to the Anglo-Saxons who were coming to conquer them. That was even said on the floor of the United States Senate at the time of the war. We did that with the Filipinos in in uh, the Philippines when we invaded and conquered and took over, at least in practice, if not completely took over, certainly uh, began to control at the turn of the last century uh, that nation for our own ends. And as a result, nearly a million, perhaps more than a million Filipinos died, also a racialized minority in our country. In Nicaragua and throughout Central America beginning in the 1920s, we began to look 
at our adversaries there, Augusto Sandino and his followers, for example, as terrorists, as racialized others, as heathens, as beasts. These were the words that our Secretary of War and other officials in the United States gave to them. This is what we did to the Japanese, of course, in World War II. It wasn't enough to be at war with them. It was enough, apparently, in the minds of those of us in this country, so many that they must be racialized, that they must be viewed as beasts, as animals. If you look at the pictures and the, uh, the cartoonage, you know, from the newspapers at that time, you will see the racialization of our adversaries, of our enemies. We did the same with Southeast Asians throughout the Vietnam War and the bombing of Laos and Cambodia, and we've done it again with Iraqis. On the one hand, we know the way we have racialized foreign others is central to understanding issues of imperialism, but I would suggest that we've done the same domestically with almost every issue that we speak of. So if we're talking about education, healthcare, job creation, taxes, crime, immigration, if you look again beneath the surface, what you will find is that nowadays, and perhaps for the last 40 years at least, all of those issues have been bound up with a racialized narrative, so much so that any time that any politician advances the notion that we as a country should do something to help the have-nots or the have-lessers, even when they are not necessarily racialized others, they can include and often do include white uh, folks who are working class and low income. But whenever we talk about helping those who have not or have less, the narrative for the last four decades, for at least now two full generations, has been one in which the American mind goes to what space? It goes to that place where we begin to believe that what we're talking about is really racial redistribution. That's what politicians have told us. Whenever we talk about helping the least of these, we're really talking about helping them. And if you don't believe that that is why we have a diminished social safety net over the last 40 years, you haven't been paying attention because it is indeed central to it. If you go back 70 years or 80 years, you'll find what? You'll find that this was a country which, although it never did nearly enough for the poor, had a much different view of the poor and the unemployed, those in pain during the Great Depression. It was a period of time when government intervention to help those on the bottom of the barrel was something that we understood was necessary as a country and had the support of most everyone, particularly in that thing that we like to call the working class. But something happened between the 1930s and today that changed our attitude and our perceptions of the have-nots and the have-lessers so that we no longer apparently as a country believe in that kind of government intervention, whether it's in the housing market, whether it's in the job market, whether it is in the educational system. We no longer believe that. What happened between the 1930s and today? Because you see, big government was something that just about every white person in America believed in. Now, the rich, they didn't like it, you know. The rich wanted poor people to work for them at whatever wage they were willing to offer. But virtually everyone else understood the importance of government intervention. That's what the Homestead Act had been. It's what the Fair Housing Act, excuse me, the Federal Housing Administration had been. It's what the GI Bill would be. It's what the VA program would be. It's what every advance in the last 70 years or so of our country had been based upon. And yet, beginning in the 1960s and then in the 1970s, as people of color began to gain access, you know, the same programs, the same opportunities that white folks have always had access to, the same kinds of government interventions that white Americans have always had access to. That's when we discovered our inner libertarian as a nation and decided that we no longer needed that government intervention. So now the notion of the public good is almost completely absent from our political conversation, so much so, so far into our conversations now that I recall a couple of years ago when we were talking about health care reform in this country and when the president floated that terminology, you may remember, of the public option, which of course is no longer a part of health care reform. It's essentially absent you know, from that particular piece of legislation. But I remember when he floated that terminology, just for a moment, you know, because it didn't last. But the terminology itself, I knew when that was floated that we as a country were going to have trouble because whenever we say public anything in this country, what do folks hear? What do white folks so often in particular hear? Think about other public things, and you'll know what I mean. Public housing, who lives there? Public transportation, who takes that? Public education, who are the children who are increasingly in those schools? Whenever we talk about public, the perception is it's about helping them. And so, because of that racialized narrative of the last 40 years that says they are not deserving, whenever we talk about helping those at the bottom, whether it is in regard to jobs, health, housing, education, or anything else, we hit this roadblock that 70 years ago we didn't have. You have to understand the centrality of racial resentment 
the centrality of racial anxiety in the white American political mind. I don't mean all white folks, but I mean this collective corporate thing known as white America, the group to which I'm addressing uh, my latest book. You have to understand how that racialized narrative has shaped our understanding of virtually every public policy. In fact, there's research uh, now, three or four different studies, which have all found the same thing, that the primary reason why the United States has such a paltry social safety net relative to those other industrialized nations to which we like to compare ourselves. The reason that we don't have guaranteed health care, the reason that we don't have the kinds of safety net programs that so many other countries that we like to compare ourselves to have, according to that research, is one thing in particular that sets us apart. You know what that is? It's not our history of weaker unions. It's not the so-called Protestant work ethic and the centrality of that to our country. Those things are in the picture. But the primary thing that explains, according to that research, the number one most highly correlated factor with reductions in safety net programs and the very lack of those programs to begin with is apparently, according to those studies, the belief held by far too many in our country that if we had programs like that, some people, and in particular black and brown folks, would abuse them. In other words, it is the belief that those people will take unfair advantage of the programs, which actually explains why we don't have the programs. And I want you to think about the irony of that. As we think about poor folks of all colors, as we think about folks struggling right now in one of the worst economic downturns this past five years that any of us have ever seen, and hopefully one of the worst that our children or grandchildren will ever see, and we look around and we realize that the very people the very people who have advocated cutting those programs, the very people who have voted for politicians who have promised to cut those programs in the name of deficit reduction or tax reduction or whatever the case might be, millions of them now find themselves needing the very same programs that all of those years they had the luxury of believing were only for them, you know. And so what have we done? This racialized narrative now leads us to a place where we don't have the very things that most all families need increasingly, whether that is decent and affordable health care, whether it's decent and affordable college education, whether it's job training or retraining, whatever the case might be. That's the condition where we find ourselves. We find millions of Americans voting against their own interests every single time they go to the polls. And why? Because what they've done is they've been allowed to define their interest in racial terms allowed to think of themselves in relative terms to the dreaded other. And so long as they have a little bit more than the black man, a little bit more than the brown woman, a little bit more than the black and brown child, then they're okay. I may not have much, but at least I'm not black. I may not have much, but at least I'm not Mexican. I may not have much, but at least I'm not indigenous to this continent. Defining our interest in relative terms has been the history of race in this country. And it's brought us to this place now where, if you will recall, back in the Tea Party thing kicked off, right? You remember what actually started this? It was a very telling moment. It was a man by the name of Rick Santelli who plays a business reporter on television. He's not actually much of a business reporter. He doesn't actually understand a whole lot about economics, but he gets to play one, you know, on TV. And he went on television, you'll remember a few years back when there was a discussion about bailing out homeowners, right? upside down in their mortgages, losing their homes. That's where this actually started. He was on the floor of the Mercantile Exchange in Chicago. He was surrounded, backed up by all these really quite affluent white men trading things that don't even exist. I mean, you know, commodities that actually only exist on paper. We're just like trading things. We're just moving around money. We're not actually producing anything of lasting value. That's what we do now as a country, right? That's what our economy is based upon, is moving paper around. Like it's one big poker game. So there he is, he's backed by these rich, very powerful white men, and he looks into the camera, and he talks to them, and he says, do you want to keep bailing out those losers, right? And all of these guys behind him say, no, you know, it's like a big party. You know? They just, uh, they're having a great time making all this money, and they're joking about the losers who apparently got in over their heads, right? The ones who weren't responsible enough to take out a proper mortgage, the ones who got roped into those predatory loans, but it's really their fault. That was the narrative. So Rick Santelli was saying, we need to have a new Tea Party, and he wasn't talking about deficit reduction, he wasn't talking about the size of government in the abstract, he was talking about the proposition, still unfulfilled, that we as a country ought to help those who got through no fault of their own roped in to those high interest rate mortgages because they were lied to by mortgage brokers, and they were lied to by those lending institutions who told them there's nothing to worry about, you know, we'll refinance your loan, we'll never let you go underwater, and so people fell for it.
And now the government was merely saying, maybe we ought to do something, and Rick Santelli was calling them losers. At the very same time, I should point out, Fox News and other media outlets were spinning a narrative that said that, that housing crisis was all the fault of banks and mortgage brokers giving loans to, as Neil Cavuto, another make-believe economist on television, right, called it, giving those loans to minorities and other risky folks. That was his terminology. So they're telling you that it was loans to those people. And Rick Santelli is calling them losers and saying we need a new Tea Party. In other words, this entire movement was predicated on greed. It was predicated on the notion of superiority relative to those brothers and sisters of color, for those of us who are white in this country. And millions of people have fallen for it. So much so that you'll remember some of those rallies for health care reform. And they would go up to folks, right, the folks who were opposed to health care reform. And they would ask them, do you have health care? And people would be interviewed and they would say, no, no, I don't. Well, do you want health care? Well, yeah, I guess. Are you healthy? No, actually, I'm not. My cholesterol level is 5,020, you know. My blood pressure is 710 over 319. I could probably have a stroke in a minute. You know, I'm in horrible health. I've actually had two triple bypass surgeries already in my life. I've had, you know, constant health problems. But I don't want health care. Really, why? Well, I'd rather die than have the government provide it for me. That's what they People were actually saying that. Once again, where did we come to that? How did we come to that? I would suggest to you that if you don't understand the centrality of that racialized narrative, the narrative that says all efforts to help those in need are really nothing more than taking from the hardworking and we know what they look like in that racialized imagination and giving to the not so hardworking and we know what they look like in the racialized imagination. If you don't understand how that narrative has shaped where we are as a country today and our inability to get health care for all and our inability to make college affordable for all and our inability to pull out of the both mortgage crisis and the jobs crisis that we have right now, then you haven't been paying attention. You have to understand how important that has been and yet none of our politicians will speak to it. None of our media will speak to it. We act as if race has absolutely nothing to do with it. We allow ourselves to believe that it's really just a competition between those who want lower taxes and smaller government and those who want higher taxes and bigger government, when it's never really been about that. Both sides of the political aisle in our country love big government. The only question is for whom will it be deployed? Those on the right have always loved big government. White conservatives have always loved big government. As long as it was distributing land to us, that's what the Homestead Act was, 240 million acres of virtually free land to white families at a time people of color couldn't get it. That's what the FHA program was. That's what the VA program was. That's what the GI Bill was. That's what the Interstate Highway program was. Big government is something that has been ubiquitous and virtually all have agreed that it was good. The only difference is that now when we speak of using the force and the power of the state to bring about greater equity, we find ourselves getting that kind of pushback and understanding the centrality of race to that pushback is what we have to have as we go forward because the truth is if we don't do something about this profound racial disparity that haunts us today, not in exactly the same way as it did 200 years ago in the time of Martin Delaney, but in a way that ought to give us pause nonetheless, if we don't deal with that in the next 25 to 30 years and deal with it concretely to the point where we don't only speak of it, but we actually begin to narrow those gaps. We are going to be a truly ungovernable society because in 25 to 30 years, we know the facts, right? Half of this country's population will be people of color. Half will be white. That's a fact, and it doesn't matter whether folks like it or not. I know there are some white folks in Arizona who don't like it at all. Right? But I'm not real worried about them because I've been in Arizona lately, and I can report to you without fear of contradiction that the average age of white folks in Arizona is about 137. <laughs> So, you know, tick-tock. Um, <laughs> I don't mean to be cruel, and I'm not advocating the death of old white Arizonans. By the way. So don't tweet that. You know. Shouldn't be tweeting in church anyway. I'm not advocating their death. I'm just saying everybody dies, and age is highly correlated with that particular condition. So my guess is that if we do the work, those of us committed to justice and equity in a multicultural future, we can probably outlast them, but know that you must do the work. Just because the calendar pages change, just because the clock hands move, will not in and of itself bring about justice. It will bring about a different demographic reality. That's going to happen, no matter what. But we also know that white folks in South Africa held on for an awful long time, and they were only 
of the population. So unless the work is done, unless we commit ourselves to narrowing those racial gaps in income and in wealth, right now the typical white family 20 times the net worth of the typical black family, 18 times that of the typical Latino family. It's not because we worked harder. It's not because we prayed harder. It's certainly not because we possess some superior investment wisdom that people of color lack. I mean, if you haven't learned anything from the global economic crisis, at least learn this. A handful of very rich white men can actually lose a lot of money. And they can do it without any help from black people. No Mexicans, be they documented or not. No Asian Americans, no indigenous people. Just a handful. The richest, most powerful, highest SAT getting white men on Wall Street, because you know, you gotta be brilliant to get a job creating nothing of lasting value. You just need <laughs> money. You must be a genius. How in the world can you figure out how to make billions of dollars out of nothing? Well, apparently they couldn't figure it out for long. That's why they lost billions of dollars. Twelve trillion, as a matter of fact. Dollars wiped out in the last few years by the handful of people at the top of the economic spectrum, but we're still blaming the people at the bottom. See, that's where we are as a country. We're still more afraid of young black and brown men crossing the street in our direction wearing a hoodie, are we not? Than we are rich white men driving around in their Lexuses or Lexi, I don't know the proper <laughs> thing. We're still more afraid of the usual suspects because that is the legacy of the past brought into the present, even though the usual suspects, those that we've been taught to fear, couldn't do as much damage to this country if you gave them 5,000 years as what was done by the people at the pinnacle of the system in about an 18 month period, 12 trillion dollars. Think about how long it would take for, if you took every black and brown street thug ever and put them all together, they would have to rob you around the clock, man, for like 5,000 years just to get, and even then they wouldn't even get close to 12 trillion. You'd be like five millennia in. You'd ask them, like, y'all have 12 trillion? And they'd be like, no, not even close. Come back in about 2,000 more years. Maybe we'll have it. But even then, they'd have to have their hand in the pocket, hand in the pocket, just constantly stealing. And they still couldn't do as much damage. That's not what we're encouraged to fear. It's not what we're encouraged to think about. And as a result, as a nation, we are, once again, not focusing on the needs of a multiracial democracy. And if we don't do it, we'll get to that day in 30 years, right, where we're half people of color and half white. And if we are still at that time, a country where half of the population is twice as likely as the other half to be out of work, three times as likely to be poor, one twentieth in net worth, nine years less life expectancy, double the rate of infant mortality, double the rate of low birth weight children born to moms, as is the case in the other half, we're not going to be a functional society for anyone, not just those people of color marginalized as a result of racism, but also ungovernable and, un and completely dysfunctional for white folks as well. So we have some real work to do. And the first part of that work is recognizing as we commemorate the life and the birth and this instance of Martin Delaney, we have to remember that so much of what he was dealing with and what those who came after him dealt with, we are still experiencing today. We've inherited that legacy. Inertia is not just the property of the physical universe, you know, it's a property of the socioeconomic and the political and the cultural universe as well. That from the past has come with us into the present. We will either address that or our children will curse us for having given them the same legacy that has been left to us all of these years. I thank you so much for being here today and I hope to see you all this evening where we can talk about this at greater length. Thank you very much. <laughs>